It's been a while since we had a Mario game, but we have a doozy this issue as we cover Nintendo Power number 77 for October of 1995. Our cover game this issue is Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, with art that looks like it's replicating the game's storybook art style while also maintaining the digital look as well, which fits more with how it plays out in the game, which is nice. There is a letter this issue decrying the depictions of girls in games, along with the types of games marketed to girls, basically calling for more girls in active roles, less sexualization, and more games with women and protagonists that don't fall back on lazy and sexist stereotypes. It's something that we've taken steps towards in the 15 years since this issue was published, but it's still a situation where we have a long ways to go. I'd like to think that we would have accomplished some this goal sooner, but well, at this point in gaming, in 1995, the industry, the video game industry, is giving toxic masculinity a bear hug of an embrace, and even now, in 2020, it's still trying to wrest itself away from that. I hope the person who wrote this letter is still someone who plays video games, and I hope there are games that they are finding games that appeal to them. In the top 20 ranking, Mortal Kombat 3 and Yoshi's Island are entering the rankings. Um, Super Nintendo version for or Mortal Kombat 3. And Mega Man X is also returning to the Super Nintendo chart. Earthworm Jim is entering the Game Boy rankings with Mortal Kombat 2 re uh, returning. And our genre ranking is of arcade ports, which is dominated by our, by fighting games and two basketball games. Our Hall of Fame inductees are Mario's first outings on each of Nintendo's platforms to date. We get to our cover game with uh, Yoshi's Island, with notes on collecting all of the things to unlock all of the levels, along with notes on alternative forms for Yoshi, and finally, we get world maps for at least four worlds from the game. Yoshi's Island is one of the best Super Nintendo games on the platform. Straight up. Visually, it's a treat for the eyes, with a unique style that stands out among the rest of the Mario franchise, and it controls so very well. The ability to hold down the jump button to have your Yoshi wiggle their feet in midair to put some English on a jump provides just the right spin, no pun intended, on the Mario World jump physics. Landing various trick shots where you're cramming an egg around corners or obstacles to hit a target is immensely satisfying. But where things get a little iffy is having the work to work with the automatic scrolling of the targeting reticle. This is something that later Yoshi games on other platforms have executed better because they're on systems with an additional analog stick to allow more granular control. Except, unfortunately, later Yoshi games lean more heavily into 100% completion in order to actually be able to advance in the game, which is frustrating. So, as far as the last of the core Nintendo-developed Mario games are concerned, Yoshi's Island is an incredibly strong final showing on the Super Nintendo before we move on to the Nintendo 64. We have some preview coverage on the Super Mario RPG. We get our first look at the game, with a focus on the pre-rendered graphics and platforming, but less on the hybrid of an active and turn-based combat system. I'm going to hold off on the full-on coverage for later once we get more into the game. Well, after the amazing Yoshi's Island, we now have the dire Batman Forever, and we have notes on... Uh, how Batman and Robin play differently, and notes and partial maps for multiple stages. Batman Forever is kind of a clumsy mess. It's not completely unplayable, so it has that over some of the uh, NES Kuso game that made it into Nintendo Power back in the day. But the game is still kind of garbage. You activate your gadgets using Street Fighter style controller combinations, but they're just clumsy enough that they're never able to really pull them off. The game also has the incredibly bright idea of using a foreground layer to show just how much graphics they have, without considering how badly this impacts the ability to play the game in terms of judging where enemies are in comparison to you. Now, the game is a brawler, not of the belt-scrolling um, Final Fight variety, but more of the single-plane Kung Fu variety. But it uses fighting game controls. All four face buttons are mapped to different strengths of attack, and jump is mapped to up. All of this done without any consideration in advance to how this would impact traversing the environments. And finally, because the, char the digitized character designs are supposed to evoke how cool the characters looked in Mortal Kombat, but because the gameplay is like a, is, is like a brawler, it ends up making the levels even more monot monotonous, where you're only getting like one or two enemies on screen at one time. They end up being very hit spongy, so you have to jump around, so you have to try to platform over them to do crowd control stuff. And 
So again, they're just they're, they're very generic looking, seeing the same character designs over and over again for a very long time. It makes the levels incredibly monotonous. In short, Batman Forever should have been the cautionary tale that warned the game industry away from Mortal Kombat Mythology's Sub Zero, but sadly, it was not. Next up is another possibly dire fighting game with Primal Rage. We have some general gameplay notes and notes on each of the fighters along with the setting. Rage. Primal Rage is an interesting concept on the fighting games. Expand. You, you take your kaiju fighting game concept, use digitized puppet characters as opposed to people in suits, oh, or animated sprites, and give it all a big post-apocalyptic twist. It's just that the controls are pretty dire, and Look, with fighting games, with kaiju fighting games like King of the Monsters and that sort of thing, your characters are all spins on existing mo motion picture kaiju. Here it's just dinosaurs and giant apes. So, consequently, the inhumanity of the characters actually makes it pretty difficult to find someone who really grabs your interest. You have a degree of shorthand, with even with like fighting games that aren't based on an established franchise when they came out, but like, Blaz like Blaze Blue or Undernight, um, In Birth, or all that, or we, uh, we got the first Guilty Gear game. The character, you look at the character designs, because they're generally people, and to get a something from these characters, for, from this a sense of character, to give you an appeal beyond just, oh, this is the guy whose moves I can pull off. Here, there isn't really that, because a lot of the characters are just so similar to each other. Like, not that they're like, you know, like five ninja, uh, Mortal Kombat ninja style palette swaps. Um, the dinosaurs and the apes do have a, enough degree of difference between them that it's clear that they did some significant tweaks to the models, and their animations and attacks are considerably different. But, that said, the character designs, like, like, there's not enough there to make me go, oh, I like this guy. I like this dinosaur or this ape that has some sort of creative kind of appeal to me. They have a level of personality through their actions and animations that make them that catch, hook, catch in and hook my interest. That's just not there. So, that's not, so it's makes it hard for me to recommend picking this up. Also, as it is, there are some significant corners that had to be cut to fit this on a Super Nintendo cartridge, which leads me to recommend instead um, the, getting the version of this game that is in one of the Midway Arcade Classics collections, because that has the full version of the game with ending cutscenes and that sort of thing. We have another Nicktoons game with, ah, real monsters, and there are notes on each of the four playable characters and on various stages. I have no memory whatsoever of this show, so it just comes across like another game in the vein of Earthworm Jim, of a platformer with some incredibly fluid animation and some heavy gross-out gross elements, but where the level of detail actually makes the game a little too difficult to navigate. I have no idea if the sh actual show is good, but this game doesn't feel as like a particularly satisfactory companion for it. The Blue Bomber is coming to the Super Nintendo with Mega Man 7. We have level maps and a general boss order, but no coverage of Dr. Wily's castle. Mega Man 7 puts a strong foot forward by putting, poking fun at itself in its opening cutscene or giving a decent Mega Man X-style tutorial level where you get to run through most of the existing mechanics before getting two pretty straightforward semi-boss fights where you can find your footing, and along with introducing a new character conceit with a opposite number to Mega Man and Rush with bass and treble before finally giving you your Robot Master Select screen. Otherwise, the game's control feels generally solid and movement similarly clicks in the game the way that it did in the, in the NES games, even with the larger and more expressive sprites in the game's level. Well, that said, there's a few places where it stumbles, particularly with the, with the amount of lives that you get and perhaps more prominently, continuing with one-hit kill spikes. This is at its most egregious, to give an example, um, at in Burst, Burst Man's boss chamber, where the entire focus of the 
fight is putting spikes on top of the room, combined with a weapon that encases you in a bubble and sends you the spikes if you can't break out of the bubble in time. Yeah, you can get out if you shoot fast enough, but if you get got by two bubbles in quick succession, then you're done for. And this is aggravated by having some bubbles which you can shoot in advance and others that you can't. Others that you can't. With the difference being based on color, in particular red, which really screws over people who are colorblind. It's It feels like a deliberate attempt at escalation by Capcom in terms of the boss design. Like, oh, what? Well, we're on a new platform now. How do we make this mega classic this regular mega man boss fight different from mega man x boss fights i know we'll have we'll give the amp, the boss a weapon that can one hit kill you that's not cool otherwise the game is fine it's just got a few persistent quality of life issues from earlier games and so those are stuck around here and probably should have gone away the most recent mega man anniversary In the Epic Center News column, we get a rundown of titles that are getting a Japanese release, but aren't getting a U.S. release. Sid Meier's Civilization is out for the Super Nintendo. We have general gameplay notes, particularly focusing on the early game. And as someone who has played Civ 2, 3, 4, and 5, this is a grand strategy game that I feel comfortable reviewing, going back to the game's roots. Civilization for the Super Nintendo feels like Civ. That may feel like a tautology, but it's significant praise here. If you've played any of the later Civilization games, you will have a familiar feeling from this in all the right ways, from the one more term addictive gameplay, the level of strategy, the map screen, everything. It just works. That said, this is the first game, and the later titles have tremendous, uh, progressively tremendous. That said, this is the first game, and the later titles have progressed tremendously from this point from having the tech tree visible in game to being able to very quickly move through menus. And on top of that, because this is a console game on a cartridge as opposed to an on disc console game with memory cards, you only have one save slot. Still, if you want to see where the series came from and maybe try out a more simplified version of the game, this is worth checking out. Just make sure to load up the tech tree on your phone or tablet or on a adjacent monitor screen so you can pick the right text for what you want to do. We have Nintendo Power starting their early coverage of Secret of Evermore with a bunch of general narrative and mechanical notes with the promise of more to come, so I'll hold off until there's more to come. We have more strategy notes for the various boss fights in Chrono Trigger. In classified information, we get a bunch of really useful cheat codes for Super Return of the Jedi. And we're starting a well, Virtual Boy block here, as in spite of the console's best efforts, we are still getting more Virtual Boy games. We start off with the shoot 'em up Vertical Force. And then the Virtual Boy games continue with Bomberman puzzle game spin-off Panic Bomber. We have the now playing a little earlier on the issue this time, with the also rants including a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers fighting game. We have a little Game Boy coverage this issue, with a look at the Game Boy version of Aladdin. We are maps of the first couple stages, and notes for a few more after that. Aladdin for the Game Boy feels like a bigger and more ambitious Tiger Electronics game. By which I mean, the game tries to replicate the levels and scope in the Super Nintendo game on the Game Boy, but the choppiness and the movement and the weirdness of some of the hit detection and location of some of the platform ledges feels like someone's trying to bite off more than they could chew with one of the older Tiger Electronics LCD games. Now, as someone who appreciates ambition in game design, I applaud the attempt, and I do appreciate the fact that they balance the size of the sprites and the camera's perspective well. That is a thing which I have brought up repeatedly as a problem that lots of game developers have with the Game Boy. It's just that they didn't quite pull off what they're trying to do here, and it makes for a barely playable game. It's, it's not unplayable, it just barely is. The sports column is Game Boy focused this issue, and we have a golf game for that system covered here with PGA Tour International. Unfortunately, I'm not able to find a ROM for that game, so I'm not going to be able to review it. 
In Counselor's Corner, we have a whole bunch of additional tips for Killer Instinct, like how to do a combo breaker and what a jump-in combo is. In Pack Watch, Mortal Kombat 3 is coming to the Super Nintendo, just in time for it to also come out for the PlayStation, along with Earthworm Jim 2 and Mech Warrior 3050, along with a glimpse of Jack Brothers for the game, for the Virtual Boy. For my pick of the issue, we actually have something of a toughie here. I love Yoshi's Island and Civilization both a great deal. I'd even argue that Civ is a little more approachable than most of the other Koei games we've had so far, partially because it's outside of kind of the bubble of the Koei grand strategy game engine, and it's being developed by outside the company in general and that sort of thing. But Yoshi's Island is a classic for a reason, and so I'm going with that as my first pick. That said, Civilization is a very close second for me, and in the event that you already have Yoshi's Island, which is entirely possible if you're somebody who's looking to build a Super Nintendo collection, like picking up all the Mario games for the console is one of those things that's early on the list. So, and you, you like Civ and you want to try an earlier installment of the series, the Super Nintendo version is definitely worth checking out. Next issue, we get our first coverage of Mortal Kombat 3. We'll see you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.